This video is a bit of a summary of the series it ends. It's about the effects of believing in countries, races, and other imagined hierarchies. It's about our choices in the face of propaganda. Before telling the tragedy of the anti-communists, however, we need to talk about what they supposedly oppose. When people think of communism, they think of the Soviet Union or China first, but don't. They're not communist. You can watch this video if you'd like to argue about that. In fact, when we try to define communism as the ideology of a state, our definition becomes circular. Communism is whatever they do, and whatever they do is communism. States use philosophy for their own purposes, which evolve faster than dictionaries. Am I saying all the people who claim communism means dictatorship like the USSR or Vietnam are wrong? Yes, I am. So let's ditch the propaganda definitions of communism. What's the communist ideal? Communism means a society with no property or money, because resources are shared, so there's no poverty and no classes to fight each other for control. Communism means no central authority to force us to work and follow its laws, so instead we make and enforce rules and norms together as equals. Equality requires eliminating oppressive ideologies like white supremacy, patriarchy, and ableism. It means no borders, so people aren't held back by lines on maps. Communism is also the movement, such as it is, against capitalism and for a communist society. Communists work towards these communist ideals. Until states and empires took over the earth, most societies in the world were communist in at least some of those ways. And we sometimes use the term primitive communism to refer to communal living in small bands, as opposed to modern communist movement. Socialism means a lot of things, so I'll mostly avoid using it, but basically it's an ideology, movement, or system where the workers as a class control or aspire to control the means of production, or are transitioning to such a system. That's why communism is thought of as the goal of socialism. Workers seize control of property in the state and then phase them out. This topic's a big one, so I made a whole series on it I link to in the description. Communism and capitalism are, to me, excellent examples of when people like words, but don't actually like the idea they represent, and vice versa. Nobody likes capitalism. Nobody likes working all day for some boss, knowing it's making a few people rich while they stay poor. Everyone wants to be rich because the purpose of getting rich is to escape from what nearly everyone experiences as capitalism. Work, commuting, stress, poverty. Communism, meanwhile, practically everybody likes and practices every day. We help out and share things with our friends and neighbors all the time, along with giving to strangers who need it without recognition or tax breaks. We idealize living in safe, healthy, sustainable communities as equals. We decry poverty and inequality and the violence that goes into maintaining them, the lack of democracy, the environmental destruction, etc., etc., but the solution we get offered is always just different capitalism, because the only alternative to capitalism is communism, and communism's bad. But if communism means a free and fair society with no systemic oppression and deprivation, why do most people think it's a totalitarian state with no food? Well, Timmy, the sad truth of the world is people in power lie about everything. The so-called communist states that, after all, grew out of communist movements used the language of liberation and equality to seize and legitimize their power. The openly capitalist states could say, look at these hellholes, that's what communism is, that's why you don't want it. In fact, we might have to invade them to make them see reason. 
As a result, for about 200 years now, states have been crying wolf about communism. The words become a normal part of the propaganda, so it gets used to mean anything the ruling class, or sometimes just its more socially conservative members, are against. And that's the environment all of us grow up in. So even though we hold various communist ideals, we're strongly against the word. And in spite of our experience with it, capitalism comes to mean prosperity and freedom. Because that's what we've been told over and over and over and over. The ruling class has derived three major benefits that I can think of from its demonization of communism. First, there's the idea that communism is inherently bad, so there's no need to learn about it, just reject it. Second, we have the vague impression that any change to the status quo is utopian and would only result in civil war or something until we inevitably found our way back to capitalism. Unless, of course, that change is more power for the people with power, which is always considered realistic. Third, the state can crack down on unorthodox thought and claim it necessary to defeat the subversive internal enemy. Even people who call themselves libertarians might cheer on the targeting of leftists because commies are evil. When people realize the capitalist, imperialist, white supremacist patriarchy they live under doesn't work for them, they begin to resist. They find others who are resisting. Some think beyond resisting their immediate circumstances to the systems of oppression that they live under. And that's where you find socialists like communists and anarchists and anarcho-communists. Socialists look at the system as a whole and point out how oppressive it is and that there's an alternative. That makes them dangerous to the people with all the money. Any serious movement for liberation from the Panthers to the Palestinians gets repressed. For the past century, when a socialist movement has become too powerful, the ruling class has responded by encouraging fascism. Fascists in the streets or the halls of power get support from capitalists to crush the threat to the status quo and get the money moving again. At any time, there are some radical dissenters, but in the supposed good times, radicals are mostly black and indigenous and queer and homeless people, and as the only people who pose a threat to the state's existence, it already has considerable resources devoted to keeping them down. But when things get bad for everyone, more people turn away from the system to a new system or to the destruction of all oppressive systems, and more than the usual police are needed. It's clear to me we are in such a time again as leftist ideals and organizing are becoming more prevalent, but the right wing is becoming more militant. They're winning popular votes, dominating online platforms, and trying to take over the streets. These people are well financed. As it turns out, this guy, like many members of the fascist goon squad, calls himself anti-communist or anti-anti-fascist. As basic arithmetic could tell you, an anti-anti-fascist is a fascist. An anti-com, anti-antifa isn't just someone who doesn't like communism. It's a fascist in places where it's considered unsavory to admit it. Now, you might remember I said there's a world of difference between communism and what gets called communism, but one feature of the anti-commie is he's opposed to both. He doesn't care about the distinctions. He might even dream of building an ethnic commune in the woods somewhere, but of course, he would never call it that. All he needs to know is commies are against the hierarchies of race and wealth that he wants to uphold. He's opposed to any words and feelings he's been taught to oppose since childhood, and communism is definitely one of those words. So what was his upbringing like? The first thing the anti-communist remembers is his parents and teachers taught him to love his country, or more accurately, its symbols, which he puts on his wall and salutes every day. The adults yell at him for sharing, 
being diplomatic instead of fighting and wearing pink that one time. But otherwise, they don't have much time for him and kind of leave him in front of the TV all day. Even the cartoons seem to prove our system is better. When anybody preaches disunity, tries to pit one of us against the other through class warfare, you know that person seeks to rob us of our freedom and destroy our very lives. And we know what to do about it. In school, he learns about his country's glorious history and heroes, who all happen to be white guys with guns and maybe slaves who happen to be black. He learns the way his heroes dealt with problems was by killing off whole groups of people. He learns that was all fine because it helped build his country and civilization. The adults in his life teach this boy to play games to win. To believe in winning is inherently good. Something that matters, even when it doesn't matter. He listens to athletes and rich people giving TED Talks and concludes winning is important. Though he's still fuzzy on why. But that doesn't matter. He reasons these successful people say it, so they believe it, so it's probably true. He gets coached by Ron Swanson. Capitalism, God's way of determining who is smart and who is poor. So he becomes competitive, trying to outdo the people around him and prove himself. He's unsatisfied because he never reaches the goals he thinks others want him to reach. And he doesn't really enjoy the activities he engages in because he focuses on winning. He bullies others in school, sports, wherever, to make himself feel better by proving himself superior and to muscle out competitors. He finds it's much easier to get others to ignore or approve of his bullying if they already have a reason to, like if the victims are different races or nationalities, or don't conform to our norms and reach our standards. Defeating someone makes him feel better. Because it was the only thing Mom, Dad, and Coach Ron ever valued. Naturally, the guy is drawn to people who confidently say the same things he's used to. Be proud of and defend your country. White men built this country. Life is or should be a competition to find the best among us. Men should dominate people they consider weaker. Things were better before non-white, non-men had a voice, and we should return to something that never existed. He learns to speak confidently, too, because you're more persuasive that way, and because that's how you get laid. He starts calling himself an alpha, and other guys betas, because he knows gender is a spectrum, but he imagines it as a hierarchy. He wanders deep into online communities. People tell him, you've been lied to, and uh, a group of rich elites control the world. Because it only takes the most basic observation to realize what we've been told all our lives isn't entirely true, and we have huge inequality. But if, like most of us, you've never questioned things, it sounds like a stunning revelation. The guy finds everything blamed on wokeness, then on communism... Then, as he goes deeper, the Jews, who are behind all the wokeness and communisms that are trying to replace white people. He regularly consumes media that make him angry at everything that gets called communism. All the time he's being fed this stuff, he never asks what the word means. Because communism is whatever you disagree with. Moving to a new place, trying to stay healthy, acknowledging racism dancing or whatever's going on here but also not dancing big corporations presidents of capitalist states upholding the law this is like communist level shit. forget the egalitarian society the last stage of communism is when a rich guy gets arrested for one of the hundreds of crimes he's accused of then our anti-communist watches this movie which clinches it for him Communism is all over the place. Man, what did you do? You spilled the communism? 
Oh, it's all over the place. Now I have to make a movie to warn people. The guy figures he has to be anti-communist to protect what he's been told he values against things he's been told are happening. He's got reasons. Trans people exist. Mask mandates. Black people in movies. Plus the commies are going to take your children away. And the anti-communist has already harassed workers at Target and burned his shoes. So he's ready for a rally. You've seen anti-communist rallies before, right? They don't always go as planned. Fascists are really dangerous because they love power and violence, but they have this thing about underestimating their opponents. These communists are all cowards. In building their pure Aryan society, they might get beaten up a few times. You go around acting tough and end up on the ground. You underestimate the anti-fascists you're fighting and you get hurt, maybe multiple times. This guy's been taught power and money are the measure of a man, but he isn't connected to power and money, so he's insecure. He invents hierarchies of race, nation, and gender and puts himself at the top so he can have that small measure of power over others and feel better about himself. Tragic. Rallying to defend made-up hierarchies and finding out they don't protect you from pepper spray. But what if the anti-communist succeeds? What if his dreams of white supremacy, where everyone's dead or subordinated to white men, come to fruition? The first change the guy might notice is he has to work more. The people who did most of the work are gone now, so cishet white people will have to pick up the slack. As loyal partisans, they would never dream of unionizing and would get punished for suggesting it anyway. Unions are commie bullshit. He sometimes dreams of the simple life he was promised in the return memes, where him and his trad wife could walk around topless on a hillside all day, but he realizes they were always just promises. There are no more ethnic communes he could run off to. They've all been destroyed to force people back into the workforce. What's more, child labor is legal now, so his kids go off to work in factories all day from the age of five. The only education they get is chanting slogans about race and blood and heroes and enemies. Competing, bullying, and snitching are all compulsory now. There is no more public space left, but it doesn't matter because people are at work all the time, so there's no time to enjoy it, so no one notices. Nature is rapidly being wiped out, but any objections get shouted down as inimical to the market and foreign communist propaganda. Then there's the war. Fascist states and their media spend a lot of time talking about enemies, because as we learned in my last video, enemies are how you maintain power. When nationalist fever builds high enough, it tends to spill over the border. The Generalissimos decide they would expand their power by waging war, so they draft all military-age males. But our anti-anti-fascist was going to sign up anyway. He hears about how communists along with Muslims, Mexicans, and Mauritanians, are coming in from the neighboring country to threaten our country, race, religion, and gender norms. And the correct response is to invade that country and kill all the communists. Well, that's right up anti-communist alley. Next thing he knows, he's pointing guns at people in a city where he doesn't speak the language, in constant terror of getting killed by the local resistance. One day, he gets shot in the back and bleeds out as kids look down at him. The last thing he sees is a child smiling and walking away with his gun. What did he live for? To make people miserable so he could feel a little better about himself? What did he die for? Abstract notions like race and nation that were invented by the powerful to make guys like this defend their property for them. But we have choices. Unlike the anti-communist, 
we don't have to fight for other people's power. We can think critically about what we hear, choose our values and priorities for ourselves. We can take care of each other as equals, rather than trying to be superior. We can oppose the concentration of power and the harm it causes. We can appreciate the beauty of life and freedom without wanting to destroy it.